Sometimes, he said, rubbing his face briskly with his hands, a gesture she found familiar, he felt like a stranger when he arrived back home, like an important guest of some kind. It wore off soon enough, but then it happened again. Life in two halves was not ideal. Still, what is? You had to live with it. He leaned back in his chair, cracked his finger joints and smiled. The waitress brought their bill. It was thoroughly night when they left. A three-quarter moon hung low in the sky to the east and a scrap of sea miles away reflected the light. Away from the street lights, everything was grey, silver or black. She was thinking about the specimen, what exactly it might turn out to be, how much of the skull would be there, how much of it could they get out unbroken, what a huge undertaking the preparation would be. She was thinking that it would be wonderful if finally the debate over the way the large flying reptiles became airborne could be resolved, if it was something that she might do. She was thinking how she might, must get hold of Rivers, who was writing up the tarsal bones Colin had referred to, and see exactly what he thought those were from. She was thinking about the National Geographic, the Natural Science Foundation, the lesser in-house sources of money, what the competition for grants might be this year, who to ask to referee, who else it might be beneficial to bring in. Mike cleared his throat. Look, he said, in a clipped, business-like tone as they turned into the hotel driveway. The sign, Mountain View Hotel, was lit with a single lamp. The ugly, low-slung building was set back beyond some landscaping and a car park. Look, I've got a proposal to make. Let's sit here a minute. He gestured towards one of the picnic tables set beneath a clump of immature fir trees and that then sat on it. Anna remained standing. She assumed that his thoughts were running on the same line as hers. It's this, he said. <laughs> I'm still trying to work you out. I used to think you must have gone gay, but it certainly looked to me like you had something on with that Brazilian at the conference last year. What? She almost asked him to say it again to be sure that she had heard correctly. Didn't they have other far more important things to talk about? What on earth was he doing, and now, of all times, could he not give up? Look, Mike, she said, keeping her voice as steady as she could, let's not go there. He ignored her, smiled even. It's commitment you don't want. Is that it? He was right, though she never would tell him so. She stood there, astounded. I can't give it, he said. So? We have a fit. What I think, you see, is why don't you and I have some fun when we meet up like this? He reached out and ran his hand down her arm from shoulder to wrist, then slipped off the bench and pulled her towards him. His hands gripped her waist, his erection pressed into the layers of thin fabric that separated their skins, and it was odd, very odd, to have her mouth open itself to his, her skin ignite. At least half of her rushed to greet the experience, even as another part pulled back, waiting for an opportunity to speak, which clearly was not going to exist unless she made it. She could have said, OK, Professor Swenson, on your head be it. He was an attractive man, offering a simple thing, Leave aside Lily, the kids, he was too close. Even as things were, she saw him fairly often, and now she'd be working with him on this dig, for heaven's sake. Whatever he thought or said, it would get out of hand, and when it ended, he would very likely make a fuss. She pulled away. Believe me, it won't work. He grabbed her arm. What is the matter with you, he said. And, just as she had years ago, she did half admire him for knowing somehow that he was not getting the truth. But it was not as if he had a right to it. Since when was there a law that said a person should give a detailed explanation if they decided against fucking someone? I thought you were asking, she said. Mike, that's my answer. No, I want to go in. Let me go. He did not release her, but yanked her closer, grabbed some of her hair with his, with his other hand, and it was then that she hit him. Without thinking, she punched him with her right hand in the face. His nose buckled, her fist, fist slid into his cheekbone, a noise that was hard and wet at the same time. Pain shot up her arm. He gasped, let go of her. She burst into tears. Sorry, she said, sorry. 
Blood was running over his lips and chin. Maybe, Anna thought later, she should have stayed to look after him, found an ice pack, wrapped it in a cloth. But at the time, it didn't occur to her. She had never done a thing, such a thing before, and he was furious. She just wanted to get away. She pushed into the hotel, and the brightness of the lobby and the busy pattern of the carpeting seemed extraordinary, surreal in its vividness after the ghostly moonlight outside, and everything she saw shimmered because the tears, once started, would not stop. The flickering of a television set showed through the frosted glass of the partition behind the desk, but thankfully the receptionist was asleep. A sign next to him said, Scott. His head rested on his folded arms. All Anna could see of him was a thatch of dark brown hair. His sleep was thick and inert, in all ways oblivious, and she took the stairs, let herself into the room, locked the door, and then kicked at it until her toes hurt. Why the hell could Mike not leave well alone? Why must he have everything? Why could he not respect her, even if he thought she was wrong? Why fight? Why now? Okay, so that's... The, the opening situation, <laughs> uh, which, as you can imagine, goes on to fester and, and develop throughout the book. <laughs>